Yeah, I don't know how, see now I've already blown it. For some of you, this is deja vu all over again. None of you got that, did you? Yogi Berra? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Every once in a while I try and say something funny. I should stop. Second Peter, we're going to take a broad look at Second Peter. We're restarting our series in this wonderful little letter. It's a powerful letter. And uh, in Peter's first letter, well, actually, let's read in Second Peter chapter 3, because this really is kind of the hub around which this letter turns, there's another scripture we'll look at here in a minute, Second Peter chapter 3, and it's just verses 1 and 2. Peter writes, this is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. In his first letter, we were introduced to a church who was uh, facing many difficulties, right? Suffering, uh, severe trial and testing. And when a church faces difficulties and when a church faces the prospects of a fiery trial, we learned in his first letter that it needs the true grace of God. And that really was the theme of the first letter. That is, if I can make the arrow appear again here. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. Everything that Peter had to say about submitting to authority and the work of Christ and all that went into it, he wanted, you to, he wanted to make sure that you understood that it was undergirded by his grace and that was the top of his mind. And it's centered on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2, 21 and 20 through 25. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return, while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls." sort of the two passages that 1 Peter sort of revolved around, was built upon the true grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Taking our sins up in his body, remember, upon himself, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And he presents Jesus as our type, as our example, for undergoing suffering, Jesus unjustifiably so, and sometimes justifiably so for us. That is part of the human condition. Uh, that is part and parcel of uh, the effects of sin in this world, that there will be things that we don't like, there will be suffering, trial, testing, all of these things that we will endure, are called upon to endure. Jesus was able to handle it, and he did, and he honored his Father in every aspect or facet of life, and Peter calls on us, he called on us in his first letter to do the same. That is, make, it, make everything about life, everything in life, about him, about him. 
and that will give you that will give you the proper perspective as you deal with various things in life. In Peter's second letter, he wants the church to protect the truth by stirring up your minds and your understanding, by reminding you of the commandment of the Lord, by exhorting you to growth in grace, in the knowledge of the Lord so that you are not taken in by error or lose your steadfastness to endure, be steadfast, persevere. We hear that from the pen of the Apostle Paul and we hear it from the pen of the Apostle Peter. <clears throat> in chapter 2, Peter is warning us of false prophets and teachers. In chapter 2, as he first starts out, false prophets also arose among the people. That is, within the nation of Israel, false prophets arose. Just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. False teachers, duplicitous false teachers, bringing destructive influences to derail you. Beloved, it is a, it is a worldview battle. And Peter wants you to stand firm in the truth, built upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and, and his death, burial, and resurrection. Standing firm in him so that whatever arrows, so to speak, may come your way, you will stand firm. You will be encouraged. You will be helped. You will continue to grow through it. And you will see uh, the hand of the Lord at work. In chapter 3, we are going to see that he warns of those who mock the faith. <clears throat> we think... We tend to think, I, I think especially because we have so much media and such a variety of media today, it, we almost hear it instantaneously when someone is mocking the faith and we hear of these things that go on. Well, it happened back then as well. It isn't just a modern day phenomenon. It happened in Peter's time and they were mocking especially as it regards the coming of the Lord. Oh, it's just, you know, things have been going the same way ever since the fathers fell asleep. Where is the promise of his coming? And so people disregard God's intervention. They disregard his providence. And we're going to see that God indeed intervened in our history many times, but especially two times in history, at creation and at the flood, at various other times as well. But God did intervene, and he will intervene in the future. We need to be patient. We need to wait, because those who are numbered among the children of God have not yet been filled up. And I would add to that that the sin in the world has not yet been filled up either. You might think it has been, but it hasn't, lest judgment would come now. So we need to be patient. God knows what he's doing. I don't know how many generations are left. I know we keep saying, boy, I wish he'd come now, I wish he'd come now. But we cannot deny future generations of those who will name his name, of those whom he will display his grace and save. So we need to be patient and endure, remain steadfast, so that others around the world might continue to come into the family of God. In chapter 1, he encourages you then to pursue preventive measures. Preventative measures. How often do we hear about that in regard to our physical bodies, in regard to our physical health? 
Well, that's true spiritually as well. You can take preventative measures now to protect yourself from the influence of duplicitous false teachers that he talks about in chapter 2 and those who mock God in chapter 3. But you have to avail yourself of it so that when the time comes, you are already remaining steadfast instead of being rocked here and there and carried about and made to question things. Because false teachers just aren't real blatant, are they? Secretly they come in. Deceptive heresies. Perhaps filled with half-truths. It might kind of have a ring of truth to it. And you're not quite sure because you haven't been keeping up on your preventive measures. How do you do that? Well, by being sure of your grounding. Being sure of your grounding. And when I say that, that's really an ongoing process. A process that never stops, that never stops. So I'm going to sort of give some highlights as to what we are going to be addressing in the future. In order to be in a position of protecting the truth, uh, you must know the truth yourself, right? You need to know the truth. You need to know the one who is the truth, Jesus Christ. You must make sure that you are on the path that proceeds in the truth. Okay? It isn't... It isn't that we simply encounter Jesus at the gate, so to speak. We need to enter and walk on the path. And Peter shows us how. Peter shows us how. That we might proceed in the truth. We need to remember that in this process there is no neutrality. People will often feign neutrality. Well, I'm not against you, so to speak. I just don't believe the way you believe. I believe in materialism. Well, right away you should know that that stands in an antithetical position to the Lord God of heaven and earth. Right? He isn't material. He is spirit. And we believe that God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth. We're not materialists. We're not monists. That is, we don't believe that all is one. We hold firmly and steadfastly upon the scripture and in the scripture and what God communicates to us. And those who hold to other views, they may not actively or at least appear to actively oppose you and undermine you, but what they hold to does. And remember, beloved, there is only one truth. There's only one truth. There is God, and there is the lie. There is God and his way, and there is the lie and the pathway upon that. No neutrality. And so... Peter exhorts us, make sure that you are involved in cultivating the truth into your life. And when I say cultivating, you know, when you go out and you prepare a garden, it's that same kind of thing. You don't just go out and throw some seeds around. You have to get rid of weeds. You have to prepare the ground. You have to aerate it. You have to do all these things. And finally, you get to plant the seeds. And then you got to tend to it and take care of it, lest it get choked out. So Peter helps us in that regard. <clears throat> so it is important to understand that you are given proper resources in this life. You are given, now think about this, you are given everything for life and godliness. Everything you need for life and godliness found uh, through the Holy Spirit in the pages of his word. 
Everything you need is right here. Through the encouragement of your fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, everything for life and godliness. He has given us his precious and magnificent promises. Throughout every generation, God's people have been called upon to embrace his precious and magnificent prom promises. Man shall not live by bread alone. But what does he live by? He lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. His precious and magnificent promises. And it is that which promotes growth. And so he exhorts us to apply Christian virtues. To secure our gains. That is... Make things such a habit in your life of godliness that it becomes second nature to you. And beware of pitfalls along the way. Beware of distractions. Beware of pitfalls. In protecting the truth, approach your walk with due diligence then. There are some practical uh, application you will have a successful walk in the Lord that is what is important your walk in him paramount there are eternal implications the entrance to the kingdom will be abundantly supplied to you will be abundantly supplied to you Peter says and then as we have seen, we want to accept reminders as a normal part of life. A normal part of life. And I want you to remember that you may know the facts of things, but you can still forget. Did you know that? You can know the facts. You can have an intellectual engagement with certain things. And I can say certain things and you can respond, oh, well, yeah, I already know that. But the key is, have you forgotten it? You say, well, of course not. I just told you I knew that. Well, then what's the key here? Well, to forget at that point is to fail to put into practice what was known once to be the truth of God. You have forgotten when you have failed to incorporate it into your life. That's why we say, in part, that it is an ongoing situation for us, beloved. Ongoing. It's a continuous walk with our God. Above all, in protecting the truth, you have the prophetic word, the more sure prophetic word. It is not another fable or tale. Right? It's not just another story. It's not just another bedtime story that we find interesting things there. No, it is redemptive history. It is God's activity, God himself acting in human history. Not just a fable. It's corroborated by witnesses to his glory, to Christ's glory. And the Father's commendation of the Son. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him, he said. And these witnesses that faithfully, that faithfully did what our Lord had asked them to do. And wrote down the pages of the scriptures. These witnesses were moved by the Holy Spirit. Carried along. By the Holy Spirit to communicate all that the Father desired. So that everything that we have in the, in the scriptures is everything that God wants our generation to have. That's why we spend so much time going through it. And repeating sometimes. And hitting it from another angle. And approaching it from still yet another angle. And reinforcing and thinking it through. Because we need it constantly. 
Be aware of destructive influences in chapter 2. When it, wherever the truth is proclaimed, there will be those who seek to subvert it. There will be those who want to see if they can counterfeit it. Uh, to put it another way, to make it more palatable to the hearing. That can be kind of hard, some of these words in the scripture. Some of it is very difficult, and especially today, it cuts against the grain of society, of our culture. And the issue is, what will you embrace? The truth? Or what human wisdom deems is fit? There will be those who seek to subvert it. These influences may originate both inside the church and outside the church. So warned the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 31. Paul is meeting with the Ephesian elders, and he had called them to himself, and he had been speaking to them, and among other things, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Be warned, therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish, or that's our word for counsel, to counsel each, each one with tears. Influences will come in. Uh, theological liberalism which you may think, how could anyone believe that a church would deny that Christ rose again or was born of a virgin? And yet, it has happened. And the church wasn't ready for it. And it succumbed to falsehood and heresy. Parts of it. Peter says, don't allow that to happen to you. They will entice you. They will introduce heresies. And they will exploit you. They will use you. They will take and take and take. And it seems like they're busy. It may seem like they're doing the Lord's work. But they're using you. They're using you. Peter says, be on guard. Be grounded, chapter 1, so that you can be aware of these things that come up in chapter 2. Know, though, that they cannot escape God. Sometimes in life it will seem as if those who do evil, those who stand opposed to God, have the upper hand and are making headway. And you'll scratch your head and you'll wonder, why, God, what's going on? It seems like they are making better headway than we are. They cannot escape God. Be assured of that, beloved. How do we know? How do we know this? Well, redemptive history. God dealt with the sinning angels. God dealt with the ancient world wherein he preserved Noah. God dealt with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah wherein he rescued Lot and his daughters. Therefore, God knows how to rescue you and how to keep the unrighteous under judgment. Right? Right? they are not going to get away with it. 
You will be tempted maybe to sort of ease your standards. You will be tempted to sort of go along with the flow. Everybody else, maybe someone you respect will say something and it doesn't sound quite right, but you think, well, I respect this person. He's got to be right. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Be careful. Be wary. And then lastly, we're going to cover the theme of God's intervention. Be sure of God's intervention, beloved. Mockers will come. Perhaps there are numbered among those who are false teachers. And they will deny God's involvement in the affairs of this world. But I'm here to bear witness to God's providence, beloved. I still am humbled and amazed at what God has done in my life and how he delivered me. Especially when I hear the stories of others and dealing with some of the same kinds of things that I had to deal with and did not come through. And they'll make excuses as to God's activity and saying, well, if God really did that, why didn't he do all this extra stuff as well? Don't buy it. Don't swallow it. We are those who stand firmly in believing that God in his providence is at work. And they will deny the Lord's coming. And they will embrace uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past. Things have always remained the same. For some, today is the first day of life. Did you know that? Some have no regard for history whatsoever. And they say, well, now is what matters. Don't, don't buy into it. We need to remember redemptive history. And what God has done. God intervened universally twice, at the time of creation and at the time of the great flood. And we can be sure that he will intervene in the future. Now think about it, at creation it was really universal, right? Because it was the universe that came into being. And the earth. And he shaped it and he formed it as he brought all material into existence. And the great flood, it's not, it's not a great warning, is it, if it was a local flood? That means people were spared. That means certain aspects of the world was spared. But that's the point of Peter is that nothing was spared in this world. Nothing was spared. As he intervened in the past, so he will intervene in the future, and it will have cosmic repercussions. Cosmic. The heavens and the earth will be affected. And so now heaven and earth are kept for later judgment. How do we regard the promise of his coming? Beloved, I have told you before that many have told me that, yeah, I believe that Christ is going to return in my lifetime. Maybe you have even said it at one point. And, and I've conducted the funerals of each and every, well, not each and every one, but all of them from around here that have said it. Again, would I love to see him come back like right now? Yeah. Yeah. How do we regard the promise of his coming? Not slow as some counted, but we regard it as patience, the patience of the Lord. The patience of the Lord, the long suffering of the Lord, allowing his word and his Holy Spirit to do the work in the world and around the nations and bringing many to himself. Not wishing any to perish, wanting all to come to repentance. What do we do while we wait? 
But we need to be careful how we live our lives. And we need, we need to live our lives looking forward to a new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And it won't be a guessing game at that point, beloved. Think about that. It won't be a guessing game because the Lord will set forth the kingdom and his glory. And it will be according, according to his righteousness. Paul says, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. He's writing to Timothy when he says that in chapter 3, verse 15, and he says, But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how... You know, I am so thankful Paul was delayed often so that he'd write a letter, <laughs> so that we would have it for later. God's providence, beloved, God's providence. I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. If we lose our grounding in chapter 1, we'll succumb to the false teachers of chapter 2, and we'll be those who question and mock, and we don't want that. It isn't each one has his own truth and everyone's right. You realize not every, every proposition can be equally valid, right? At concerning a world view. There are a lot of fanciful ideas out there. People trying to make sense of life and the world and where it's heading where it came from and why we're here. Well, God sets it forth for us and Peter exhorts us and encourages us to walk therein, to lay hold of it, to embrace the truth of God. So Paul says it's a pillar in support of the truth and as such then, Peter says the church is to protect the truth not succumb to modernism or relativism or any other ism, but to stand firmly upon the truth of God, speaking the truth in love, but nevertheless standing firmly upon it, being sure of your grounding, being sure of destructive influences that will seek to infiltrate and also by being sure of God's intervention. Father, thank you for your word to us and all that it means. For your Holy Spirit that speaks to us in your word and, and how Peter uh, sets forth everything in such a manner for such us. Such a manner for us to be encouraged and build upon. Build upon. And so in these coming weeks, O oh Lord, we pray that you would help us as we delve deeply within your word to be encouraged, to be a blessing, and to know your blessing, O oh Lord, that it might be shared with others as well. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, and the praise through Christ our Lord.